muscle attachments. What is the muscle connected to? Okay, so we know that usually muscles attach to bone. Most of the time they attach to bone, two different bones, right? They cross over a joint and attach to two different bones so that when the muscle contracts, the movement occurs at the joint. Okay, usually muscles are connected to the bone by a tendon. So this is the most common type of, the most common tissue that connects the muscle to the bone. Tendons are dense, regular, connective tissue, which you guys know means collagen fibers, right? Kind of in very strong fiber. Okay, they are cylindrical in shape, meaning shaped kind of like a rope. You can feel this if you feel your Achilles tendon, right, the one that's in the back of the ankle. You can feel that ropey shape. And again, they connect muscle to bone. What do ligaments connect again? Bone to bone. Okay, there is another kind of um, not as common type of attachment called an aponeurosis. <laughs> Aponeuroses are basically like tendons as far as, you know, they can connect muscle to bone. These can also connect muscle to muscle. Okay, so we'll take a look at an aponeurosis and I will show you what I mean by that. Instead of being shaped like a rope, they are flat. So it's the same type of tissue, this dense regular connective tissue, but they are flat sheets of it. Okay, so that's the main difference is really their shape. This is an aponeurosis here. So this is not supposed to just be the skull. This is actual connective tissue on the top of the head. This is called the epicranial aponeurosis. Epicranial means on top of the head. And it connects this muscle here, the frontalis, that's over the eyebrows. It raises the eyebrows. Connects it to this muscle back here that's called the occipitalis because it's over the occipital bone. So these two muscles will actually work together. They kind of can move the scalp a little bit and they can raise the eyebrows. This is also an aponeurosis here. You can see this flat sheet of connective tissue that the external oblique inserts in, okay? So we also have some in the abdominal region. Most of our muscles are attached to the bone by a tendon though. Okie dokie. So if you've heard the terms origin and insertion, these are the two muscle attachments. Let's talk about the difference between them. This diagram is using the biceps brachii muscle, which is right here, it's a superficial muscle in the arm, anterior arm, as the example. And you can kind of see where these two attachments come way up here. These are actually both up on the scapula. Okay, and then it comes down and it inserts on the radius. Okie dokie, so what is going on here? Now we know that when this muscle contracts, when this muscle here contracts, what do you think would move? I mean, what body part is going to move? Would this muscle pull the shoulder down toward the forearm or is it going to pull the forearm up? It's going to move the forearm. Why would that be? It's because of the weight, right? This is easier to move. This is heavier, this is lighter. That's, that's the reason. So the origin of the muscle is the heavier attachment. That's actually all that means. Okay, so the heavier attachment, and because it's heavier, it usually does not move during contraction. It remains stationary. Okay, the insertion, you can see this is called the insertion, is the lighter attachment. Okay, so I think this is actually on this next slide here. So the origin is heavier, does not move, and it is usually closer to the trunk or actually on the trunk or torso, which is why it's heavier. Okay, the insertion is lighter, so it gets pulled toward the origin. Okay, it's gonna be pulled toward the origin during contraction and usually will be located farther away from the trunk on a body part that is lighter, right? Easier to move. Does 
sentences. Mm -hmm. um, what for the spinal cloidal mastoid, what's the origin and the... That's a good question because there are some muscles where it looks like the origin and insertion are kind of like, okay, which is which because they're kind of close together, like maybe around the neck area. The sternocleidal mastoid is a muscle that actually is named after its origins and insertions, which is nice because it helps you to remember what the origins and insertions are. Okay, so this tells you it has an origin on the sternum, also on the clavicle. Clido refers to the clavicle. The insertion is on the mastoid process. So this is the insertion. These are both origins. Okay. So would the name of the origin normally be the first yes. in the front? So whenever a muscle is named after its attachments, like for instance, there's another one, coracobrachialis. Okay, corico refers to <coughs> coracoid process and brachialis refers to the brachial region, right, the arm. So this is the origin, this is the insertion. Again, the coracoid process is closer to the trunk, right? Brachial region is the part that's more movable or lighter, so this is the insertion. So in a muscle where the name tells you the origins and insertions, and actually there aren't a lot of muscles that are named that way, most of them are named um, differently, but the origin always will be first and the insertion will be last. Thank you, that's helpful. Sure, yeah, so going back to your question about which is which here, the reason that these are the origins is because, again, they're kind of more on the trunk area. The head is more easily movable, right? So this is the insertion. This muscle is the muscle that you see when you're turning your neck, or turning your head, right? Kind of stands out here. So that's what it will do. It will turn the head toward the opposite side because if you think about what's happening, when a muscle shortens or contracts, the two ends are coming closer together. And so you can visualize this. If you look at the muscle and you just picture what would happen, you know, if the two ends come closer together, you can kind of visualize that movement. So if you picture the insertion here moving toward the origin, which would be right in here, then you can see how this sternocleidomastoid on my right side will actually turn my head toward the left. And then you see the muscle kind of standing out when you do that action. If they both contract, it's gonna pull the head down this way. Again, pulling the insertion toward the origin, so that's called flexion. This is just rotation, right? Left or right rotation. Okay, so those are the actions of that muscle. Okay, so when you guys are learning your muscles, I want you to learn their origins and insertions and actions. Okay, so where do you find those? They are in the tables in chapters 11 and 12, okay? So if you go to those tables, you'll see a list of muscles, and then if you go over, you'll see a list, you know, they'll show you their origin, insertion, and actions for each muscle. Okay, so if you guys have looked at this, you probably have noticed this is a lot of information because it will give you the exact spot on the bone that the muscle attaches to. So it can be a very wordy, like paragraph, you know, that tells you exactly where it attaches to the bone. Do you have to know all that detail? No. So I will tell you how to simplify these, okay? You wanna make sure you write this down so that you know when you're studying. Okay, you can simplify the origins and insertions. Okay, simplify the origins and insertions. I'm just going to abbreviate this, okay? The O's and the I's to the name of the bone, or sometimes it's multiple bones that the muscle attaches to. So you can take your highlighter 
and highlight those. You can write them out if you want, however you want to do it. This is what you need to know, okay? Also, if you look at the action, you will see that most muscles perform more than one action. It's very annoying. <laughs> it's just the way our muscles are. Okay, so I'll give you an example of that. Going back to the biceps brachii, this muscle does do this action. Okay, this is called flexion of the forearm. But because it crosses over the shoulder joint, it has its origins up on the scapula, it also flexes the arm. It also does this, which is supination. And that's because if you look at this diagram, okay, both of these origins are up on the scapula. This one actually comes way up to the top of that glenoid cavity here. Okay, so it attaches to the top of the glenoid cavity. This one is on the coracoid process. And this is, the insertion is actually on the radial tuberosity. You guys remember the little bump on the radius, the radial tuberosity? So because of where the radial tuberosity is, when this muscle contracts, it does this action, which is called supination. Okay, so it performs all those different actions. If you learn the first action that's listed, that is enough. The first action that's listed is always the strongest for that muscle. And its strongest action would be flexion of the form, okay? So you know the first action listed for each muscle. That is enough. Now remember to understand those actions that I was just spewing out at you, <laughs> flexion of the forearm, flexion of the arm, supination, all that stuff. Remember, go back to chapter nine and read about those movements. <laughs> They're all in chapter nine, okay? Now, <laughs> this can still be kind of daunting because you have a lot of muscles on your list. So I just wanna explain something to you. As you start to learn the muscles, this stuff, a lot of this, for a lot of your muscles will become kind of, uh, I don't know if it will be obvious, but you'll kind of get it just from seeing where the muscle's located. So you'll be learning these muscles, you'll be learning where they're located on the body. If you know the names of the bones, which hopefully you guys do, if you didn't learn the names of the bones very well, then it will be more challenging for you. But this will give you another opportunity to learn the names of the bones, okay? So if you know the names of the bones, you'll be able to kind of see, you know, based on where the muscle is at, like, okay, it looks like it has its origins on the ribs and the sternum and inserts on the humerus. So, you know, you'll kind of be able to eyeball it and make an educated guess. Same thing with the action. You can often, you know, picture what the action would look like if you picture the insertion moving toward the origin, like as the muscle contracts. And so you can kind of figure these out a lot of times and you don't have to necessarily memorize everything, okay? Also, I will ask you about this in matching sections on the written exam. So you don't have to write these out on the practical, okay? So you just have to kind of know these well enough that you can match them up with their muscle on the written exam. So what I mean is, on the written exam, you'll see a matching section for origins, a matching section for insertions, and a matching section for actions. So you'll see some muscles listed, and you just have to match them up with their origin or insertion or action, okay? I will choose muscles from different parts of the body, okay, which will make it a little easier. So this will actually not be as bad as it sounds, okay? Okay, so this will be in matching sections. So what I think is a good idea is as you guys start to learn your muscles, you start to identify them on the models, you know, or in the diagrams, you wanna just keep this stuff in mind, maybe take a look at, okay, this is where its origins and insertions are, kind of try to visualize those, try to, you know, visualize the action for the muscle so that you start learning these along with your muscles, okay? Yeah, 
So for instance, here, instead of knowing that this long head of the biceps, this is called the long head because the tendon is longer, attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle, and the short head attaches to the coracoid process, just know scapula, right? So the book will say, you know, supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula, coracoid process of the scapula, okay, radial tuberosity of the radius, just know the name of the bone, right? Scapula radius. Any other questions on any of that? Okay guys, so you'll be identifying most of these muscles on muscle models. We have a lot of models, I just haven't gotten them out, so I will show you those in just a second. There's only a few you cannot see on the models because they're too deep. Okay, so I will show you or I'll list those on the board and I'll tell you what figure number is those are seen in and um, you can write that stuff down. I'll do that after you get started on these. So this is one of the models that would be on the test, this little guy. He is showing just superficial muscles, right? You can't take any of these off to see deeper ones. And I would not ask you to identify anything on the face here because it's too small, okay? So just, you know, the rest of the body is pretty clear, but you can only see the superficial muscles here. Okay, so this, this, shows really good detail and what the rest of this guy doing. <laughs> okay, so you can see on how we're coming back together later. <laughs> okay, so you can see how you can actually take some of the muscles off on this model to see deeper muscles and that's why it's called together with rubber bands because these uh, more superficial muscles kind of don't stay on anymore. So you can, if you take him to your table, you can take these off and you'll see that some of these deeper muscles here are on your list. Okay. So you'll have to take these superficial ones off to see those. Okay. Um, we have models of the head. So some of these muscles here on the face are on your list. This is a great model for the head and the shoulders. This actually shows some muscles that you can't see on the other models. So again, what usually happens here with, um, I think this is here. So the way that books and models usually show them is on the right side of the figure, they'll show superficial muscles. And on the left side, you can take these off and you'll see deeper muscles. Okay. And so in mind also when you're looking at the diagrams in your book you'll see that on one diagram they'll show you superficial the next picture will probably be the deeper muscles and if you read the caption it will tell you that for the diagrams on these muscles you kind of have to pay attention to the caption so that you know what you're looking at otherwise it's very confusing okay and we also have on oh these models here show just two muscles that are in the pelvic area. So you can't see these on, like the leg models don't show them. Okay, this one is called the psoas major, and this one in the iliac fossa is called the iliacus. Okay, iliacus. These two actually kind of fuse together as they come down for their insertion on the lesser trochanter, and they both flex the thigh. This is called flexion of the thigh. So these muscles contract every time we take a step. Okay, so that is what this model is for, just those two muscles. Okay. Also, we have a bunch of, I don't know what these guys are called, upper and lower extremity models, and they are in bags. So you can take the whole bag to your table. And the reason they're in bags is because, again, some of these superficial muscles come off, and so they, they fall off a lot. So. 
everything should be in your bag. If you feel like you get a bag and something is missing, let me know and we'll try to find it, okay? So you guys can help yourself. Upper extremity and then lower extremity are down here. And then one more model I could use, and that is this one. Okay, you can take this guy's head off for the muscles of the face. Okay, and then also, this is the only model that shows <laughs> this deepest gluteal muscle. Um, so I might ask you to identify it here. The other models do not show this. This is called the gluteus minimus. Okay, so we have the gluteus maximus, which is superficial. It has been cut. Okay, and then the gluteus medius, which is the next layer, has also been cut. And so this shows the deepest of the gluteal muscles, the gluteus minimus, which is the smallest. Okay, I would not ask you to identify these other muscles here because they're not easy to see since you can't see very much of them. So we'll just use this model for the head and these muscles right in here. This is another muscle that's on your list called the piriformis. Okay, also you can use the abdomen for the abdominal muscles and for the chest and the little guy, little man that's laying down, he has an abdomen, same thing. You can use it for the chest and the abdominal muscles. I think that's it. They do have muscle models over in the study lab. They don't have all of these, but they have the upper and lower extremity. They have, I believe, a head model. I think they have a torso. I think that's all. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? So when you're using these, remember, please, when you're done with one, take it back so that people can get to them because uh, we don't have, uh, you know, lot of some of these so we have to share them okay so go ahead help yourself also you guys muscle tissues are over there if you want to look at tissues